and welcome to the Sunshine Cathedral. The Sunshine Cathedral is a different kind of church where the past is past and the future has infinite possibilities. And with that, we invite you to come and worship with us here on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. at 1480 Southwest 9th Avenue. Now, I invite you to come in and worship with us here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Our first reading is from the wisdom of Eric Butterworth. Remember, your money is an extension of you. It is a symbol of limitation or of limitlessness according to how you think while you use it. When you receive or spend money, think green, and as you handle it, keep the green side up, speaking figuratively, of course. In other words, keep your identity with money as a symbol of limitless God substance. In these human words, God's voice is heard. God is with you. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. In his teaching, Jesus said, Beware of the religious scholars who like to walk about in long robes, be greeted obsequiously in the market squares, and take the front seats in the house of worship in the places of honor at banquets. These are the ones who swallow the property of widows and offer lengthy prayers for the sake of appearance. They will be judged more severely. Jesus sat down opposite the collection box and watched the people putting money in it, and many of the rich put in a great deal. A poor widow came and put in two small coins, the equivalent of a penny. Then Jesus called out to the disciples and said to them, The truth is, this woman has put in more than all who have contributed, because she has put in everything she possessed. This is the gospel, the good news. You again. Guess what I used to be on Halloween? <laughs> I mean, recently. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I, I grew up loving uh, superheroes as a kid. Uh, of course, I grew up uh, part of the television uh, generation, and um, uh, of course, television increasingly violent. I mean, even that in the 60s, pretty, I mean, it can't be violence, but violence all the same. And uh, so my brothers and I, we thought uh, a fun way to play would be to fight. We would fight. That's how we would play. And uh, so, but we would, to make it be play, we would fight as our favorite television character. And uh, so my brother was always the Tasmanian devil, and I was always Batgirl. And uh, so it was always wonder, it was always interesting to see which techniques proved superior, the, 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 the rambunctious Tasmanian de devil or the high-kicking Batgirl. I did have the uh, advantage of being slightly older and always a couple of inches taller. In any case, I loved Batgirl. I loved all the superheroes. I loved Wonder Woman and, and uh, all of those shows that had uh, people in costumes and uh, people of mystery and uh, people with campy names and uh, people with an insatiable urge to right wrongs and work for restorative justice and fairness for all people. What wasn't to love? Of course, some of the superheroes were misunderstood. Spider-Man and the Green Hornet 
were both thought to be criminals, even though they were good people. And doing good in the world, people judged them harshly and, and said that they weren't good. And of course, the Hulk was considered to be a monster. Batgirl, of course, was my all-time favorite. Studious librarian Barbara Gordon was Batgirl. She helped Batman and Robin with their crime-fighting agenda, but they didn't know who she really was. And her father was the chief of police, but he didn't know about her life as Batgirl. She was amazing, but <clears throat> even the people she worked with and even her own family didn't know much about her. They didn't know about her Batgirl cycle that she had somehow hidden in a secret compartment in her apartment that the, that the building superintendent never even found out about. She some, they, they didn't know about uh, where she came from or why she did what she did or even who she really was. Her truth could be her shame or her pride, her detriment or her strength, and she chose the affirmative possibilities. Plus, what is better than a Batgirl kick? She, uh, Yvonne Craig was a, a ballet dancer before she became an actor, and you could see that, that graceful skill in her work. These superheroes, when they accepted their uniqueness, they contributed to others experiencing and expressing their own goodness. When they said, I am this special something, and I'm going to share this specialness with the world, other people benefited. Difference was a gift, and it was a gift to both celebrate and share. Of course, the queer hillbilly kid found these characteristics to be compelling. There was some message in that for someone like me. Difference is special, and that specialness is meant to be embraced and shared, and if you'll do that, someone else will benefit. <clears throat> These saviors of the public were givers. They weren't doing their hero stuff for glory. In fact, they insisted on anonymity. That's what the mask was about. They weren't doing it for fame. They weren't doing it for their own legacy. They weren't doing it for glory or attention or privilege or fanfare. They were doing what they thought was right. They were doing what they thought needed to be done. They were giving what they had to give, and they did it for the joy of serving. Not for adulation. They just wanted the world to be better. It wasn't about what they wanted from the world but rather what they wanted for the world. The superheroes are giving their time, their energy, their talents, their creativity, even risking their lives for others. They are building something. They are giving what they have and even what they are to build something for others. They are trying to build a just society, a more perfect union, a safer world, a healthier human family. They are sharing. They are giving in order to build up humanity. But of course, all of that is just the stuff of fantasy, right? Those are just characters that some writer has made up. Well, not really. These mythical characters represent the best of human potential. These characters represent something that is true of us. We love them because they remind us of what is within us, the desire to help, to give selflessly, to offer hope, to pick up those who have fallen down, and to remind those who have been hurt that they deserve better that even if the world collapsed on top of them, it wasn't because they deserved it. They deserved better. And there's at least one person who knows that and will affirm that. We each have superpowers to share. And as we share them, others learn of super potential within themselves. A poor widow came and put in two small coins the equivalent of a penny. And then Jesus called out to the disciples and said to them, the truth is, this woman has put in more than all who have contributed because she has put in everything she possessed. That was from our reading this morning from Mark's gospel. That widow was wonder widow. That widow was someone who knew that no matter how difficult her life was, she knew she had something to give. No matter how overwhelming life could be in her own experience, she still had something to give. She wanted to give 
what she had to help others. Some might not have thought that what she had to give amounted to much, but she gave it with love, and she gave it with hope, and she gave it with commitment, and she gave it with faith that she could be part of making something better. I hope you voted on Tuesday or before, and that you always vote. I hope you always participate in the process of making life better for as many people as possible. Our candidates won't always win. Our, our amendments won't always pass. Our issues won't always win the day. But if we are part of the process, if we are sharing our voice and our time and our vote, then we are part of the process that can make things better. There will be, it will wax and wane. It will ebb and flow. There will be hills and valleys. But as long as we're faithful to the process, ultimately the process tends to do good for more people. Our votes were our gifts. We had hours to give standing in line. And we had time to give considering the issues and learning about the candidates' positions. We had votes to give, and we gave those things to build up our society and our country. We might think that filling in some circles on a ballot is not a big gift. It's just a little thing, a couple of, a couple of mites. And yet, it was a big thing, and that big thing makes a big difference. Our votes were our gifts, and we gave them to build up our society, to build up our country, to build our shared future. Our votes were cast in secret. We weren't paid to vote. We didn't get 15 minutes of fame for voting. We just gave something to build up our country. We just gave. And even if you voted for Roseanne Barr, I hope you did so as a gift. Not as a lark, but as a true gift to your country. And that vote, even though she obviously didn't win, was part of the process that led to victories that did occur. Because the vote you cast for her didn't go to someone else, and that mattered. <laughs> your vote on election day, or your few hours of volunteer service at church or at another worthy organization, or your kind word to someone in need. Sometimes your kind word to someone you didn't even know was in need, but it still was a word in season. It, that word still was presented as a gift. It still appeared like apples of gold and settings of silver. That word to someone in need, or your moment of sharing a hug with a hurting friend or your financial contribution to something you really believe in, or you're sharing your story of coming out, or of living with HIV, or of surviving cancer, or of being in recovery, so that someone in a similar situation can find hope and courage. Your gift may not seem like much. It may seem like dropping a penny in a deep pot, but it matters. Every selfless gift, lovingly given for no reason other than to bless others, is helping pave the road to future miracles. The widow's mite isn't important because of its size, obviously. It is important because of why it is given. She gives it because she wants to be part of something bigger than herself. She realizes that her joys aren't the end of everything. She realizes that her pain isn't the end of everything. Her circumstances are important, of course, but they aren't all important. There are other lives. There are other people struggling, maybe more than she is. There are people hurting more than she is. And so she gives because she wants to be part of making it all better. And of course, she'll benefit from that too, because if it's all better, it will lift her up. If she works to lift up the world, the world then is better and can lift her up, and the cycle goes on and on. She gives because she wants to be part of something bigger. She wants some part in helping others. She wants to express her love for something, her hope for the future, and her willingness to do what she can. The widow isn't giving coins. Coins are just the form of her real gifts which are hope and love and a 100% commitment to possibilities. The Bible says, unless it is God that builds a house, those who build it labor in vain. 
It is through the widow's might that God is building God's house, a house of prayer for all people, a house for now and a house for the future. What God does for us, God does through us. Our hands are God's hands. And so instead of just saying, God, please fix it all, please fix my plight and fix the world, the widow knows if God is going to do it, it is the God in me that must be doing it. And so she gives what she can. She does what she can. She shows up and lets her hands be the hands of God, touching, blessing, making a difference. It is through her that God is building a house of compassion, a house of prayer, a house of justice, a house of healing. And because it is God in her, through her, as her, it is building it, the house is being built strong and not in vain. How fitting that we read this story on Veterans Day. <clears throat> this would have been the lectionary reading no matter what, but it just happens. One of those wonderful, powerful coincidences that it fell on Veterans Day. And so on this Veterans Day, I'm reminded of some heroic veterans in the world. I, I'm reminded of my great Aunt Lois's friend and companion, Alan. He had been a friend of her husband, and after her husband died, they became close. And um, of course, it's the hills of Arkansas, and it's uh, a long time ago, and so they couldn't really, for some reason, be totally honest about why they were close, why they were such good friends, but they were good friends for decades thereafter, and she wept bitterly when he died. In any case, her friend, her companion, Alan, fought in World War II against the anti-Semitic, racist, fascist oppression of Hitler. Alan was wounded in that conflict. In fact, he lost an eye. And he couldn't get a, a prosthetic eye because there wasn't enough of his face left to hold it. He, he lost his eye and all that could construct even a, 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 a false eye. After the war and sufficient recuperation, he then became a deputy sheriff. In those, in those days, pretty much, if you could fog a mirror, I guess, in the hills of Arkansas, they'd put you to work. And so even though he was legally blind, he had something to give. And he gave it. He lost an eye serving his country, and so, but he still had more to give. And so he served his community. He risked his life to protect the world from fascism. And he gave part of his face for the cause. And even after having given so much, he gave more as a law enforcement officer. A veteran, as veterans so often do, showed what it was to give. Not to demand, not to expect, but to give just for the joy of giving. And in the giving, lives were changed and even saved. And I think <clears throat> of all of those veterans, of course there are the ones that we know and then there are the ones that we don't know. I think of all the veterans who served in silence. The LBGT people who served their country, risking their lives, all while being, being told that they could only give such service if they would lie about who they were. That they could risk their lives for others while their own lives were not even affirmed. They denied themselves to serve others. They denied themselves the joy of loving and living openly so they could give their lives in service. LBGT people can now serve openly, but before they could, some chose to serve in silence so that others could one day serve out loud. And then there are those veterans of the struggle for equal rights. They weren't given military commissions, but they lived their lives in service of human dignity and social justice. And sometimes they didn't just live their lives for others, they gave their lives. Martin Luther King Jr. and Harvey Milk are two such heroes. Giving, not out of obligation, not to get something back, not to be praised or remembered, not to win influence or position or prestige, but giving freely, generously, lovingly, joyfully, all for the sake of building up a dream that will benefit others. That is the widow's might. It's not the cosmic lottery. If I just give enough, then one day God will give me so much more. That sort of teaching is antithetical to the gospel that shows a preferential option for the poor and marginalized. And yet, we all deserve to do better, to live better, to have more, and we do experience richer lives when we participate in the circulation of divine supply. It's not that we're priming the pump, 
It's that a life of giving is richer spiritually. A life of giving is more joyous, is more connected. And when you have that kind of wealth, then the money may or may not follow, but it doesn't matter quite as much. Giving for the sake of building up a dream that will benefit others, that's the widow's might. That's the service of veterans. That's the service of voting. That's generosity in all of its forms. And now, I want to ask you to do something. I want you to give something to the future, something more. We've each given something in so many ways, but I want you to give something more. I want you to give something to the church that is more committed to helping you believe in yourself than telling you what to believe about God. I'm asking you to give something you may not have thought you even had to give, or maybe you didn't think it was significant enough to give, but I want you to reconsider. I want you to think about this gift that you have within you, and I want you to think about sharing it, not expecting anything back. Maybe no one will even notice, but it's yours to give, and you can give it, and in giving it, you can build a dream that will bless other people. I'm asking you to give, I keep saying something, but that's a little misleading, because I want you to give three things in addition to your generous financial contributions. First, I want you to give positive speech. I'm asking you to give positive speech in service of this blessed community. That may mean giving up the habit of complaining. That may mean giving up the default position of looking for the worst. And I know that that is a challenge. I am a fourth generation warrior. And so it is in my bones. And so to, con to, to, to overcome that, I have to be intentional. The Apostle Paul says, faith comes by hearing, and so to make sure that I hear positive things, I have to be the one who says them. And so, to give that sort of positive speech, we may have to talk to ourselves first, but we can. It may mean deciding to not buy into gossip, no matter how juicy it may seem to be. And especially when it comes to our wonderful church, let's choose to speak well of our vision, speak well of our future, speak well of our calling, speak well of our purpose. If we will give the seemingly small gift of consistent positive speech, absolute miracles can happen. And secondly, I'm asking you if you can give a bit more time just a little bit more time. If you come to church twice a month, can you increase it to three times a month? If you come on Sundays only, can you consider taking a class during the year or dropping in for a Wednesday prayer service now and then? When there are concerts or shows or films, can you try to show up for those? Or when we have picnics or special suppers, can you make time for those? Can you give 15 or 20 hours a year more? Just 15 hours and a whole year more. That's all. Can you give that small but significant gift? You'll be giving something to yourself as well, but then that is almost always true when it comes to giving. And thirdly, can you help us spread the word about Sunshine Cathedral? So many people tell me all the time, week after week. Uh, they, they send me emails, they call me, they come to the office, they tell me on the way out of a church how this church is amazing to them, how it lifted them out of despair, how it gave them something they never thought they could have, how it's helped them believe in themselves more than they ever could, how they felt loved the minute they walked in the door, how they've met so many beautiful people that they didn't even know that, that, that were out there. They have all of these warm, wonderful feelings, but they're telling them to me, I know it, I know how great it is. Well, you tell someone who doesn't know, Will you tell someone who doesn't yet know how wonderful we are? Oh, we run ads out there. We're on the internet and on Facebook. We're, we're, we're in print. We do webinars and streaming video. We're on YouTube and in Second Life. We're out there. But the best marketing or evangelism, depending on the vocabulary you choose, is to just invite someone to church. Just to say, come to the party with me. An invitation to the party is irresistible, but it comes from a person one-on-one. -on -one. Let people know there is a progressive, positive, and practical spiritual community that affirms the sacred value of all people and that has a lot of fun doing it. An invitation. It doesn't seem like much, but it really is a lot. Can you give it? And let me tell you why. I'm asking for these extra gifts. 
because teens are still attempting suicide. Because even while 10 states now have marriage equality, until it exists at the federal level, same gender loving people are still second class citizens. And people who have been told they are second class need a first class spiritual experience. <clears throat> Because in recent years and months, we have seen a war on women that cannot go unchallenged. And sometimes people will say, oh, we shouldn't talk about that in church. Or I'll have fellow colleagues say, oh, I, I just don't have the nerve to say, well, get the nerve. It's not, it's, it's not acceptable to say that we, are, we want LBGT rights. But guess what? The L part of LBGT are women. And we have to know. that women and women's bodies and women's health and women's concern, it is not okay for men to wage war on that. We can have our opinions, we can have our values, but that's not what we've been seeing recently. We have been seeing people being tried to be robbed of their agency, and there has to be a voice, a sacred voice, a prophetic voice calling out from the wilderness, challenging that, because people still struggle with HIV. Contrary to the myth, it hasn't been cured yet, and people still get it, and it's not an easy thing to live with. And because people still struggle with loneliness, and depression, and addiction, and cancer, and feelings of guilt, and condemnation from religious experiences of their past, there is too much healing needed for us ever to decide that whatever we have is good enough. We need to be more so that we can offer more, so that we can reach more, because more people need this message and this blessed community. Healing is needed, and we are a hospital. Let's get the word out so that even more lives can be changed, empowered, enriched, and filled with hope and joy. Give that widow's might for what it might build up. Give that positive word, that extra time, that invitation to someone new. When you do that, you are superheroes in the kingdom of God. And this is the good news. Amen. <clears throat> are you ready to give something more? A little something. Something that may seem so little to you, you didn't even think about giving it. It just seemed like it wouldn't be worth it. I remember someone said to me years and years ago at an, in another church, he said, uh, I, I just feel bad um, because I don't have much to give. And so when the offering plate comes in, I just don't give anything because I, I don't want people to judge me for the 50 cents or the dollar I put in. And I'm like, no, don't let people, don't let, first of all, no one's looking at you. <laughs> first of all, that's all in your head. Nobody's looking at you. Nobody cares. And secondly, even if they were, don't let them rob you of the joy of giving what you can. No one's asking you to give your rent money away. But if you have something to give, don't let the fact that it seems small keep you from giving it. Well, it's not just true about money. It's true about lots of things. That invitation, that kind word, that positive attitude, that extra hour, it seems like little. But if we all did it, it becomes a lot. One vote's not much, but when everyone votes, things change. One little thing may not seem like much, but if we all give it faithfully, then it comes together and it becomes much. Are you willing and ready now to give that little thing, that little thing extra? And what you may need to give is to give up something. You might need to give up guilt. You might need to give up shame. You might need to give up worry, anxiety, fear, regret, because those things are holding you back. And when you give those up, then you find you have lots to celebrate. You have reasons to hope, and you have a future that is still waiting to be written, and it can be much more glorious than anything you've known so far. If that's good news for you, ministers are coming forward now. They're going to anoint us with oil. They're just going to give that simple act to us to remind us that right where we are, God is. And because that is true, all things are possible. On the night you were betrayed, you took the bread. After giving thanks, you broke it and said, 
This is my body open to you. And as you eat this, remember me. This is my body open to you. And as you eat this, remember me. On the night you were betrayed, you held a cup. As for giving thanks, you live, did it up. This is my life, poured out for you. And as you drink this, remember me. Behold the life you lived and the truth that you spread. Thank God, America, for heavenly love. Thank Christ, we celebrate your wondrous love. Thank God, America, for heavenly love. In Christ, we celebrate your wondrous love. At the Sunshine Cathedral, we practice an open communion, and what that means is you don't have to be a member of this church or any church to receive the sacrament. Just as you are with whatever your beliefs or doubts may be, you are welcome to participate in this feast of unconditional love. My friends, these are the gifts of God for all the people of God. Hello, I want to thank you for joining us for worship today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Again, if you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, please stop by and worship with us on Sundays at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to find out more about the Sunshine Cathedral, about our resources, or about our books published by our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Darrell Watkins, or if you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, may God continue to richly bless you on your journey.